Hello and welcome. My name is David Widmar, Research Associate here at the Center for Commercial Agriculture at Purdue University. Today I'm joined with Dr. Chris Hurd, a professor in Agricultural Economics and Extension Specialist. And today we're talking about the 2017 crop outlook situation. And this is really in light of Friday's USDA report, where they provide an update of uh, acreage and the ending stock situation, thinking about the last, or the stock situation, thinking about uh, last year's crop and how much has been sold and moved throughout the last few months. So today, uh, we're going to highlight the, the latest results from this USDA summary. We're going to talk about the latest yield and weather updates. We're going to also uh, do a quick uh, market outlook of the grain situation, including uh, Chris's Purdue estimates relative to the USDA estimates. And then we're going to tie this back and look at what the crop budgets are looking like for producers as we transition into the really the, the heat of the growing season here as uh, the corn and the soybeans are mostly planted and they begin to move into that critical reproduction uh, situation. So Chris, let's get it kicked off by talking about that USDA report and really that stock situation. We have a bit of a, uh, a time delay. The report came out Friday at noon. <laughs> it's now Monday morning and uh, there's been a lot of up. Uh, spring wheat was uh, up soft and winter wheat, hard winter wheat was up as well. Soybeans right. were up. So we knew that there was a lot of, uh, I guess, upward price momentum from this report. But let's start by looking at that stock situation. Well, and as you bring up the um, fact that the market has changed quite a lot, uh, even since that report came out, uh, there are some other factors going on as well. And obviously those are weather factors uh, that we're going to talk a good bit about as well during our presentation today. But let's start with the data, and uh, that is normally uh, mostly what we'd talk about. This time we're going to talk about weather during the later presentation. So first, in terms of the stocks, uh, corn stocks number was uh, a little bit on the bearish side. Uh, what we have here on the visual is the June 1 stocks that USDA released on Friday, 5.16 billion bushels compared to the expectations. And uh, uh, what we saw was that uh, for corn, we actually ended up uh, a little higher stocks versus uh, expectations uh, by about 65 million bushels. And so that was a touch on the bearish side. Now, soybeans were a little bit uh, lower uh, than the expectations and uh, by 18 million bushels, so a little bit friendly there. And uh, wheat also was a little bit uh, uh, higher stocks. And I'm just looking at that corn line, and uh, those should have been reversed, it looks like. The uh, 5.225, it was the June 1 stocks versus expectation 65 million higher. So on corn and wheat, uh, the stocks numbers were a little bearish, a little bit friendly on the soybean side. And this stocks estimate is based on a survey that the USDA does every quarter. And so they're surveying commercial holders of grain and farmers as well to get a good feel about how much is left out there in the bin, so to speak. That's right, and it is a survey, and obviously that means there is error in any survey that you take. Uh, these numbers are relatively small in comparison to the errors that you would expect. And what we're saying by that is that this could just be the a little bit higher, a little bit lower that you have on the data we've looked at. That could largely be just related to the survey they took, the particular individuals they surveyed. So these numbers don't tell us uh, a lot uh, specifically, uh, but we have to take them as the best numbers that we do have at this point. And for wheat, this is the last, uh, the end of the marketing year survey. So this probably is going to be very close to the final carryout number for wheat for the 16 crop. Uh, and of course, the June numbers for corn and soybeans, that's getting towards the end of the marketing year. We're three-fourths of the way through the marketing year. So we have quite a lot of data about usage already, but still uh, that last quarter to go as we finish up here in the summer and get to September 1. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how June corn stocks uh, in 2016 uh, or 17 compared to what we harvested the previous year. Yeah, so this is a little different way of looking at our stock situation. Uh, and we're asking the question on June 1 on corn in this particular case, 
what percent of last year's harvest is still uh, in the stocks uh, situation, still in either on-farm or off-farm stocks. And this goes way back there on the left to 1970, but there's a reason to put clear back at that time period. Let's look at the red lines, those roughly bound 25% on the bottom side. Now what are we saying? We're saying that when stocks of corn are low, when you're in June, just one quarter to go to finish the marking year, if you have 20, only 25% of last year's harvest that's still uh, in the grain bins at commercial or farm, those are really low stocks. You're probably going to be in a high price situation. We see those high price situations on this long-term graph back in the 70s, down around 25%. Uh, that's a well-documented high price time period. Then in the mid-90s, this was the first boom in the Asian demand for grains, and we see low stocks, and we did have not exorbitant prices, but strong prices. And then the most recent time period, uh, 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12, when we were down in 25 to 27 percent. Now we've been adding to those stocks numbers. This is why we've seen the price of corn uh, really come down sharply from those extreme highs that we saw. But I think I want to make another point here, and that is the higher bound is up around 40 percent. We're not there. We're around 35 percent. June stocks is a percent of the uh, last fall harvest. And especially we want to look at those really high numbers up in 50, 60, 70 percent. Can you imagine having 60 percent of last year's harvest still in the grain bins when you're to June and almost ready another three months to harvest a crop? The point of that is to say we are not in a stock situation like we saw in the 1980s and that terrible bust financially. So I think this again remains encouraging. We're not buried in stocks. Stocks are on the higher side, but we're not buried. And that says we can recover if we see either production come down or uh, demand utilization going up. And uh, this is looking at it as a percentage or relative to harvest. Right. And we see going back even to the 1990s, we had several years in the 90s and early 2000s where we were around that upper bound, around 40%. Right. So while we have uh, added to the stocks relative to 2000 and 10, 11, 12, which were tight years, uh, strong prices, we're not, anywhere, we're not quite to that upper bound yet. We're not there yet. And again, we not only have had strong usage, but we've had a world that generally in the last three years has not had major weather problems. Uh, so um, will that continue? Will we go uh, multiple, five, four years, five years without some weather problems around the globe? And uh, I just want to remind our listeners and viewers today that uh, there will be an archive of this webinar provided later this week on YouTube that will be free to access. And also, if there's any questions during today's webinar or after the fact, you can always email me at dwidmar at purdue.edu. That will be going across the screen throughout the webinar. And we'll follow up uh, either live or uh, afterwards with uh, an answer to your question. Great. So let's talk a little bit about how these ending stocks look in, in a bushel sense. Well, and again, this is uh, looking just at corn here. And we're just looking at on-farm storage inventories. We have uh, USDA said in this report 2.8 billion bushels of corn on farms on farms on June 1. Now, we've got that in the visual comparison going back to 2000. These are the largest on-farm inventories. Now, I'm not sure whether to say this is a good thing or a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? Well, the highest June 1 on-farm stocks in, say, the modern uh, period. Uh, that doesn't sound very positive price. What's the good thing? The good thing is We've got a strong rally going on the market now, driven by uh, weather factors right now. And farmers have a lot of grain, this is corn, still on the farm. And that probably means a lot of that's not priced yet. So I think there's where we have some optimism. Uh, they've held on a long time to this corn. Uh, there are large inventories. And by golly, right now, this week, it looks like we've got some reasonable pricing opportunities on that old crop inventory. That's the good news. That's the good news. <laughs> so uh, I think kind of wrapping up the stock situation uh, for corn and wheat, a little more stocks than what we might have anticipated, the market anticipated, but nothing uh, out of the ballpark or 
Uh, That's right. Overly, That's right. we were leaning a little direction, but nothing major on the stocks. And thinking about uh, maybe there's some opportunities given the recent rally that we've seen started late last week to maybe get some of that old crop price in the next uh, few days it's, or so. It's great to have inventory when prices are going up, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so the second part of the report that we had on Friday, uh, the first part being stocks, which we've talked about, the second part is acreage, a lot of attention focused on acreage and how many acres of corn and soybeans primarily, also wheat, uh, did the U.S. get planted in May and June? Yeah, and, and here again, these numbers um, were probably, uh, well, I think a little bit of a surprise uh, to the market, and we're looking at expectations here. The corn acreage at 90.9 planted acreage this year, USDA said, versus pre-report expectations of about 89.8. So a little over a million acres more than anticipated. Now acreage is down on corn this year sharply, but still versus the expectations pre-report, about a million more acres of corn. Uh, and, and that obviously would be bearish. Uh, soybeans, we ended up uh, thinking the pre-report expectations were that there were be even more acres shifted into soybeans, big increase already, but market was thinking there'd be more. Well, that turned out to not be the case, 440,000 less acres of soybeans. So there's a friendly element to prices on soybeans. Then wheat, we've got two lines for wheat. All wheat was down nearly 400,000 acres. Again, this is not even quite a half a million, so it's not a huge number, but it was lower acreage on wheat and where most of that wheat was, was on the spring wheat up in the northern tier, upper Great Plains from Minnesota over to Montana. Uh, so this has been the market that's been on fire with the problems of weather and dryness in the Dakotas in particular. Uh, and that's where we had lower acreage, not only lower acreage, but a threat, major threat now to low yields as well on that spring wheat. Spring wheat has obviously been driving the wheat market uh, and that got reinforcement uh, with this Friday report. And the trade, uh, the pre-report trade expectations were for about 90 million acres of soybeans, 89 and change for corn. And if that would have came into reality, if that would have been uh, what the report <laughs> said, that would have mean, meant the first time soybean acres would have been more than corn acres in, in recent history, I guess. Uh, and that didn't bear out this year, but let's take a look at the trend in these acres. It's a pretty interesting story that's yeah. played out in the last 15 or 20 years. That's right. Now this uh, chart goes back to the start of freedom to farm. And so acreage, uh, most all of our farm clients and agribusiness managers will recognize uh, prior to 1996, we did have government involved with acreage and uh, at times. And in 1996, the Freedom to Farm bill said we are going to stop doing that and acreage is going to be allowed to farmers plant whatever they want. So that's why we started with 1996. But let's look at the more recent time period. First, look at the change in acreage. The blue line at top is corn. Were from last year, the 90.9 this year down from 94 million. Now that is uh, 3 million less acres or about 3% less corn. That's a fairly major shift. The soybeans from last year up to 89.5 from 83.5. So we're looking at a, um, at a 6 million acre increase. That's a really big increase, 7% and then wheat sliding again uh, this year. Now, if we, there's a vertical line there at 2012. And if you just look since 2012, we've added about uh, 15 million acres to soybeans, 15 million acres in five years. Where does that come from? Uh, we've taken uh, almost 10 million out of wheat and about 5 million out of corn. So these are actually pretty dynamic changes going on. And I think we'll remind people what is the source of this, what's driving these changes. Uh, first, look a little bit to the left of the 2012 um, vertical line, and you'll see the big growth of corn for ethanol. And that really starts back in the 06 crop going into 07 through 2012. 
uh, we, we had substantial increase in corn acreage because we had this big new market for ethanol. But then we largely peaked out and have more or less plateaued with just a little bit of growth in that ethanol usage. <clears throat> While soybeans, the demand has been going to China and that Chinese demand was growing uh, in the 2006-2012 period, but has continued to grow. Not as that strong a rate, but has continued. So in the future, we're going to say one of these years, beans may very well pass corn because the big growth continues to be the Chinese market. Now that may slow down or may not change, but at this point we tend to say that's the case. Corn is still king in 2017, but be, be warned that may change in the next couple of years. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit. You hinted before about this change in acres, that 7% more soybean acres this year, 3% fewer acres of uh, mm -hmm. corn. Let's look a little bit about the regional variations and how this played out uh, in different parts of the country. We have a, a chart here that kind of illustrates this. Sure, and again, if you have these many acres shifting, obviously, uh, regionally, there's going to be some big shifts. The shaded green areas are ones we're going to focus on on soybeans. Let's start there. Eastern Corn Belt, we added over 1.1 million acres uh, here in the Eastern Corn Belt. The yellow are indicating where did those acreages, what crops did they come out of. Uh, that was a mix in the Eastern Corn Belt. That was from both corn, but wheat was surprisingly important as well. Uh, 330,000 less acres of wheat. We move down to the Western Corn Belt, WCB. Again, one and a half million more acres of soybeans. That came out of corn. Again, wheat is not an important crop generally in the Western Corn Belt states that I have. That's Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Uh, then we look at the Central Plains. Central Plains, 1.2 million more acres of soybeans. Soybeans, soybeans, soybeans. Where'd that come from? That came out of wheat uh, and some out of sorghum as well. Then in the Northern Plains, the Dakotas, uh, 1.3 million more acres of soybeans. That came out of wheat. So these, these are large shifts and they are market driven. Uh, obviously, a lot of countries produce wheat. We've had a big world inventory of wheat, depressed prices. And in many of our acres, even on the plains, we do have some alternatives. There's some of that land, obviously wheat is the only real crop they can grow, but other areas they can go to some other crops and they are showing that flexibility here. So let's take a look here uh, more on a state by state level. Uh, a little some interesting charts the USDA put together here. Uh, red shows us declines from last year, blue shows us an increase. And the chart we have up here now is corn, and there is a lot of red as we would have expected, <laughs> uh, but pretty much uh, right in the middle of the U.S. It's uh, all red. You have to get to the plain states before you start to see some blue. Yeah, and, and again, this is a not universal shift out of corn to soybeans, but the red states, as you point out, are those that corn acreage declined. That's the big map with a lot of the states and of course the big, many of the big production states going down on corn. Now, uh, we're going to look at some areas in particular while we have these uh, acreage numbers of planted to corn uh, up here. We wanna look at the Dakotas. And of course, we're gonna talk about the Dakotas because for the last two weeks, the dry weather in the Dakotas uh, has been increasingly driving the market and that is one of the weather areas of concern that we're going to look at more detail here in a second. And the market is laser focused on that area of the upper Great Plains. But in terms of corn acreage, North Dakota this year, USDA says 3.7 million acres in North Dakota, 5.2 million acres in South Dakota. So the Dakotas, 8.9 million acres. Now, if the Dakotas was one state, that would be the fourth largest acreage state on corn. And I think a lot of us, particularly in the Eastern Corn Belt, think about the Dakotas as, yeah, that's kind of uh, prairies, that's uh, cattle country, it's grazing. Uh, and of course that's changed over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Lots of acres up there. Now on the, just taking the Dakotas of 17 acres this year, that's 
of U.S. acres of corn are in those two states of the Dakotas. And some of the weather maps we're going to look at are going to expand some of this dry weather area on over into Minnesota. So we just threw Minnesota up there in the lower, uh, the yellow background. Uh, if you add Minnesota's acreage this year, that's about uh, 17 million acres in that upper Great Plains with just those three states. And uh, that is about, uh, last year was about 19% of uh, U.S. production in those three states. So what we're trying to focus on is that's one of the weather areas we're going to look at. Uh, and that has become a very important area with a lot of uh, production in corn and soybeans as well as spring wheat uh, and other wheat. Uh, but uh, we're really going to see that as a vulnerable area that could reduce national production. So on the next chart we hear is similar in setup. Red means decline in soybean acres and blue means an increase from last year. And it's about the inverse. There's a, a, a blue all over. Somebody spilled the blue ink on this map. <laughs> well, I think uh, that's right. Blue all up and down the plains, all throughout the Corn Belt, most of the, the southeast of the U.S. Uh, a huge swing here in soybean acres. And the, the pound sign or the number sign next to these state acreages are where there are uh, record uh, high number of acres in these states. Yeah, so the message got to producers hey, beans were $10 and higher last year. Yields generally were very good. Soybeans paid a lot of bills on farms. And so producers said, I like beans, and obviously the blue states indicating higher acreage. Now, just to help people look a little closer, if we're looking for record acreage on soybeans, you can start on the eastern side of the Corn Belt with Kentucky and then move north, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, then go across the lake states, Wisconsin, Minnesota record, record acreage, and then start down the plain states, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri of that big bean production area. Only two states, important states, Iowa and Illinois, did not have record acreage uh, on soybeans. So it's a bean year, it's a shift to bean year, and it's a big, big number in terms of the beans. Now, if we go out and look at the Dakotas, as we have there in the uh, left-hand side of the screen in the yellow, uh, the Dakotas are even more predominant in terms of soybean acreage than they are in, in corn acreage. And look at North Dakota now, 7.2 million acres of soybeans, South Dakota 5.4, according to USDA last Friday. That's 12.6 million acres of soybeans in those two states. Now the biggest state uh, of acreage this year, USDA says, is Illinois, 10.4 million, Iowa second at 10. The Dakotas together are roughly 30 percent larger, 25 to 30 percent larger in acreage than what our biggest state is. So this again says the Dakotas are really, really important on acreage. It's not the highest of the yields, but if we go to the lower uh, yellow background, uh, visual we'll see add Minnesota in there, and that gets us up to almost 21 million acres of soybeans. That's 23 percent. Last year's production in those states was 21 percent. So if you're thinking about that as a vulnerable area in terms of weather coming up here in the next uh, few weeks, then you'd have to say, wow, this could have a bigger impact on bean yields than it does on corn yields because of the more predominance of soybeans in those areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. If we'd have been here 15 years ago, North and South Dakota were not nearly as large of a player in these fall crops, soybeans and corn. But you start to combine really tough budget situations in the wheat and wheats, all the, all the wheats, especially in spring wheats, right. uh, favor, more favorable returns for corn and soybeans, strong demand in recent years in corn and soybeans, this part of the country has been adding corn and soybean acres. They become a larger player, uh, and this is and there's also been a decline in CRP acres. CRP, out and, of these and then states. another thing I think would have to at least mention is uh, global climate change, and uh, we I can remember a time when we'd talk about North Dakota is it's not possible to raise soybeans in North Dakota, the the climate just won't accept that now. Uh, whether you do or don't believe in global climate change, the reality is that uh, soybeans 
are more predominant. They've been adapted for those areas through genetics, obviously. But I think uh, the proof is in the pudding also that the climate is better able to accept soybeans. So that's another big factor. Uh, and this even extends on into Canada now as well. So uh, we've kind of uh, mentioned this and foreshadowed it a little bit, but uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota account for a large share, 10, 15, 20% of production in acres. Uh, and they're also in a bit of a weather uh, scare, I guess a weather dryness set up in there. And the first map we have here is a look at uh, percent of normal precipitation, a uh, departure here, with the red or darker colors meaning uh, less than normal rainfall and the brighter colors closer to purples and blues are above average precipitation. This is since May. Yeah, and again, the last two months, uh, primarily May and June, Let's start up in the Dakotas, and orange, dark orange, red, brown, those would be the very smallest percentage down uh, 25, 50% or less uh, of normal precipitation in the last two months. Uh, clearly, the Dakotas, we see a lot of orange, dark orange, a little bit of red and brown, but let's extend that on down into parts of Iowa and in particular, we're looking at the orange color uh, into central Iowa and kind of diagonally cutting across from roughly Iowa starting in the northwest corner down to the southeast. But that orange extends down into central and uh, northwest Illinois as well. Uh, now, those would be the areas where I think we'd have to say probably uh, subsoil moisture is more depleted. That's not to say those crops in some of those areas, Iowa, you know, looks pretty good at this point, but I think we're saying vulnerability. If you lack subsoil moisture, if you've lacked historic precipitation, then that may be a vulnerable area if we should turn off hotter and drier. Um, we're sitting in Indiana now, so let's focus a little bit on that. Mostly yellow, which is uh, 75 to 100 percent of normal, and, and really more into the greens and the blues. So that's 100, as you get into blues, more 150%. And clearly Indiana has areas it has been just too wet through a little bit on the uh, north central part of the state, cutting across the state and the eastern side of the state. Now, will that be a blessing in disguise uh, in the long run if we can end up with a more normal crop in the eastern uh, part of uh, the Corn Belt? with problems further to west and particularly northwest, time will tell in that. But we are now clearly in a weather market. And uh, the next chart here is kind of a, a different deviation of this, but we have the U.S. Drought Monitor. And not a big surprise, but the areas that showed up with running behind on precipitation in the last few months start to show up here mm -hmm. as areas that uh, have been identified as in a one uh, form of a drought or another with the most intense uh, versions of that in, in, of course, North Dakota there. Yeah, and again, I think follow that pattern, North Dakota, then coming towards the south uh, east from, um, uh, from the Dakotas, you see some of the Iowa, even a little bit in Illinois. Now, the yellow is not really a major problem. It's abnormally dry. And why would that be abnormally dry? Because precipitation has been short in the recent months. We looked at a similar, similar kind of visual earlier. Now this shows more of Nebraska, very important corn state, uh, northwest Iowa uh, in that area. So uh, the question is for the markets now is what happens next? Where are we going? We've set our country up for some vulnerable areas if we should really turn hot and dry. Uh, as we move through July and August. How does this maybe translate as we start to think about uh, crop yields and how this compares to recent uh, crop production? Okay, well, we will try to answer that question with the best information we have at this point. Now, remember the USDA uh, ask reporters once a week to report on how they view the quality of the crop. How does the crop look? Very poor, poor, fair, good, excellent. So in their area, they divide uh, the corn, soybean, wheat crops uh, into those categories. 
Uh, we call that crop conditions report from the crop progress report. It comes out every Monday at four o'clock from USDA uh, for 18 major states, uh, at least on corn. And if we look at the first column there, we're looking at this year's ratings compared to a average of 2000 to 2016. So we look at those ratings for that week uh, this year compared to the ratings for that same week in the years 2000 to 2016. We put those historic ratings in a distribution and say this year, where does this year's crop rank, rank percentile wise? And you can see we've run from about 40% back in early June. We're down around 28%, 30%. 50% would be, 50th percentile would be the middle or average. So nationally, this crop of corn uh, on these ratings is running somewhat below normal ratings, at least based on the 2000 to 2016 crops. Now we follow that through in that first column uh, on with a yield estimate. Uh, still very early to use crop ratings as a determiner of yields, um, but if we were to end up with ratings similar to where we are now, uh, then that 170.7 bushels is what USDA started with as their trend yield for 2017. My numbers are showing this crop is a couple bushels nationally below uh, that trend yield. So is this a major problem? No, it's not a major problem, but it is showing that we have some vulnerabilities already and weather is going to be very important. Now in the U.S. beans, we're looking at about the 50th percentile. So again, that's right on the average and not much change from the 48 bushels that USDA is talking about. Then we've got for Indiana, not all our viewers are interested in Indiana, but this is the state in the Eastern Corn Belt that has the most problems. And you can see we're currently at around the 12th percentile. Uh, and again, that was for the last June report. We'll uh, see very quickly report coming out uh, for updating this for the current week. But last week of June, 12th percentile, 50% is normal. So this is a relatively poor crop. We're off about 12 bushels from normal on corn yields and a little bit down on soybean yields would be our best guess at this point. And is that the right number to predict? Of course not. What happens from here on is very important for the U.S. as well as the uh, Indiana. So uh, this, based on a look today, we'll have some more data coming from the USDA right. later this afternoon. But as corn's starting to enter this critical reproduction stage, soybeans are mostly planted and start uh, into their, their productive growth phase. What does the weather look like in the next few months, in the next month, yep. and throughout the growing and this, season? And the market is uh, futures markets and anticipatory market. So it's building all this information. We'll go through these fairly quickly. This is the five-day outlook. Uh, the purple, the red are the most intense rainfall. And again, we pretty much see moderate rainfall up there in the Dakotas, uh, southern Iowa, uh, an inch or so. So that would look very encouraging at this point. And then as we get into Indiana, it looks like uh, uh, more than an inch of rain as a general statement for Indiana. Some areas too wet, that may be discouraging, but overall this time of year to get an inch plus of rain in a five to seven day period is very positive. Uh, then let's just advance and look at the 8 to 14 day forecast over on the left hand side. We have the temperature, the uh, look out in Montana, the Dakotas. This is um, the, the dome of high pressure that's been talked about moving the heat moving out of the southwestern United States more up into the uh, central northern plain states. So USDA is buying into that as we go on out. Uh, into a second week or so of July. Heat uh, in the, especially across the country, above normal temperatures, but really focus the most intense uh, above normal out in the upper Great Plains. The right hand side is precipitation. Again, uh, going on into the second week of July. B is below normal, and that's focused on the central and upper Great Plains, but extending the most intense extending on into Illinois and on uh, in through the Eastern Corn Belt. So this is really what the market's looking at. Two weeks, second week of July, that takes us to about mid-July. Mm. We're into corn pollination, 
really getting started. So this is what the market is really focused on right now. And these are probabilities. These aren't quantities or magnitudes. That's correct. So we're saying that there's an increased probability of above average temperatures and an increased probability and below average uh, precipitation, as you mentioned, as we head into this critical pollination That's phase. right. And it's easy to overstate what these maps are saying. Below normal, normal, you know, we're going to be an inch, inch and a quarter uh, in much of the central corn belt uh, per week, an inch to an inch and a quarter. So if you get a half an inch, that's going to be substantially below normal. Now, a half an inch of rain in mid-July still does a lot of good. So uh, we, we don't want to read too much into this, but this is the kind of information the market is looking at now. Then I think our next visual is the forecast. This was just out on Friday from National Weather Service. Uh, and again, focused on the Dakotas, Montana. The deep brown is continuation of the drought. Then the yellowish color is extension. Uh, drought development is likely to start moving out from that primary area. And again, here we focused a little bit on Minnesota. And that uh, is one of the reasons is we see that droughty conditions extending into northwest Minnesota. Not their high production area, but uh, again, uh, we threw Minnesota in because of this map earlier. And then uh, let's look at the 30-day uh, outlook. Again, this was just updated on Friday. Temperatures on the left keeps kind of the central Midwest moderate on temperatures, but high temperatures overall for July continuing out in the upper uh, Great Plains. And then let's look on the right hand side, precipitation. And we see from Montana and this extending on through Minnesota below normal precipitation, most intense in the Dakotas. With uh, the southeastern United States above normal precip, southern Indiana, southern Illinois, Missouri. Um, and again, this could be very, very favorable for the eastern Corn Belt, uh, Illinois, southern Indiana, if we can get the moisture we normally need uh, when other areas have some stress. So yeah, uh, to kind of recap here, the weather, we have some dryness setting in, especially in the northern Great Plains and the Minnesota. Looking at the weather forecast, uh, that's not where the bulk of the moisture the next couple weeks is going to settle in at. And it's also an area of concern looking out through the next month or so. And it's this expansion of the drought conditions into Minnesota. So there could be a, a pocket of risk here that counts for 15 to 20 percent of production for corn and soybeans. And we're going to keep an eye on that. That's right. And, and the market is pricing that risk in right now. The, yes, the market is starting to price that in because the concern is we're going to start to see ending stocks for these crops start to, to trend lower. We had been in a period of trending higher ending stocks here in the U.S., but start to trend lower. And we're going to take a quick look at that, uh, those ending stock story for corn, soybeans, and wheat. Wheat here is in green corn in blue, soybeans in red. This goes back to, to 2000. And, and Chris, what's, the, what's kind of the takeaway here from this graph? Well, I think the takeaway, uh, and again, let's say what these numbers are based on. This is based upon the June USDA estimates uh, with the acreage they had, normal yields. So we're not reducing yields at all here. This is just everything turns out normal. Green line, as you pointed out, major decrease in uh, inventory or carryover stocks. And coming from very high levels, 50% of a full year's usage we have sitting in the grain bins when we're ready to harvest the new crop, that's way too much wheat. Farmers are correcting that. We have less wheat acreage, we're getting that corrected. We can see the begin of descent on the blue line, that's corn, that's very positive. Again, if we trim yields a little bit, that'll come down more quickly. Big bean acreage, red line, keeps us pretty flat. Uh, but I, I think the message is, we're going to have to turn these stocks downward before we can turn prices upward. And that looks like it's beginning for wheat as well as corn. And this is what the market's been thinking about, this Amen. dryness and, and this, this potential for a turn down in ending stocks. So let's take a look at the balance sheets real quick. We have the USDA balance sheets here in the blue from 15, 16, now 16, 17, now looking ahead to the current new crop, 17, 18. And then here, on the far right, we have uh, your estimates here plugged in. So what's the takeaway from this? Well, I think the takeaway, uh, I've put in the acreage uh, for that was updated on Friday. I've reduced yields two bushels from what USDA I'm using, 168.7. I'm a bit more optimistic on usage. That's particularly in the feed and residual. 
Uh, again, we're looking at two to three percent increase in our livestock numbers for 2018. Uh, I see that as uh, increased demand. Uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, but not only were corn acreage uh, down, but we also saw sorghum, barley, and oats. Other feed grain acreage was down as well. And I think what that says is that whole feed base, we're going to use more corn. So I've got that higher. Bottom line, USDA at 2.1 billion bushels of carryout for the 17 crop. Remember, they will start updating acreage in July, and then uh, yields will also be updated with their August estimate around August 10 to 12. Uh, I've got carryovers a little bit lower, under 2 billion bushels, so I think we're starting on this process of getting these carryovers down. I'm carrying about a 370 price, U.S. average price, versus USDA at 340 a bushel. So a little more on the positive side. So I just looked here and uh, with the electronic markets, December futures for corn is at 399 a bushel. How does this compare to where we've been? Well, let's get it to four, okay? <laughs> let's let's get it to it, four. Yeah. <laughs> let's get that up a little bit. 399, uh, these are nearby futures. And um, uh, the most recent, this would have been July 391, we've got marked there. If you look at that point over on the right-hand side, um, so I think uh, this would have been on the July, which is still trading. But we're thinking about old crop here. And futures on the nearby at $4, uh, maybe $420, 440 I, we, We're talking about a scale up. Still a lot of old crop corn probably on the farms, are on the farms, a lot probably still to be priced. Uh, let's flip over to the December. And uh, here, uh, $4, we've got that marked. Uh, most recent rally that we had a couple weeks ago got us to around 410. So I think four dollars to 410 is certainly the first increment of new crop and for those who feel like their crop is looking pretty good at this point. Now again, the question is how much follow through are we going to get? How much to the upside? Well, tell me what the weather is going to do exactly and what those precipitations are and when they come. We don't know the answer to that. So we've got this idea of scaling up basically to previous levels where we've seen markets reach uh, kind of a, a top level. So I think uh, our first pricing increment for new crop in that 4 to 410 on Dece, then the 410 to 420, and the 420 to 430. Now can we go above 430? Um, sure, that's possible, but I think we're talking about a more major uh, dry weather situation than what would be my guess at this point. We're not in a horrible 1988-2012 uh, drought when it can't rain. Even the Dakotas are getting some shower activity. All you have to have is one of those shower activities goes from a tenth of an inch up to 1.1 inches and boy would this market change quickly. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, we've seen some ups and downs but as we close in to four dollars here on the uh, December futures contract. This is the high end of our 10 month range or so. If we go back yeah. to last harvest, September 16, this uh, that futures, December futures contract was below 360 a bushel. Yeah. So there is a lot of uh, upside here uh, that we've seen in the last few months. Well, here. I think that's right. And one of the things in marketing we always think about is that if you can sell at the high end of the range the market's been in, over time, that's going to be a good strategy. So what you just said is true. We're, we have opportunities, it looks like, right now, and this is Dece Corn 4 to 410. That's 10, 12-month highs that we've got, and I don't think anybody would fuss with selling at uh, the high of the year uh, or of the last year. Now, again, if it goes higher, we don't like that, but I think if you have um, new crop, haven't started on that too much or want to add, these are good places to start. Right now, right now. So uh, could we summarize a little bit the corn market? Yeah, we're so heading? the reports themselves were a bit on the bearish side. Uh, now again, uh, what we said is weather trumped, uh, obviously, those reports. But we are bringing acreage down on corn and overall acreage, and that means we're going to start to reduce our carryouts. And that, uh, as we said, if we can bring down carryouts, we'll be able to start to raise prices overall. I'm looking at current yields about two bushels nationally below trend. Uh, weather's the dominant factor, and we looked at that most vulnerable area up around the Dakotas. 
We said that could be 20% of the corn acres. We've mentioned there's a lot of old crop corn still out there. That could be a benefit on this rally right now if we can get that uh, remainder stocks priced. We're talking about a phase up in any weather market. It's hard to pinpoint where's the top. So we will look at some increments and add each of those increments. And I think probably the most important thing right now is to say a week ago, two weeks ago, we wouldn't have anticipated being able to price at the levels we are right now. So have a plan ready and have those specific levels and execute those plans and then expect it to really be volatile. Any weather market can be volatile and it can take a week to go up sharply and you can lose that virtually in a day if that weather situation changes. Okay, so let's transition, shift gears here. Let's look at the stock situation for soybeans. Again, very similar to the corn graph that we saw earlier, but here we have soybeans. Uh, yeah, and again, I'll just uh, mention the, the 1718 for USDA next to the last column. Uh, they were at 930 with a 930 price, U.S. farm price, with 495 million bushels of carryout. Now, uh, I've adjusted uh, acreage. Uh, I have yields just a tad bit lower than the 48 bushels they have. Uh, and I have usage a little bit stronger, and that's on the export side with the Chinese growth. I've got soybean prices at 940, 950 a bushel average U.S. soybean price. This would take us to prices in the low $9, so let's just call it $9 harvest time kind of price, very high eights. So I think that's a base. If everything comes off fairly normal, then thinking about $9 beans harvest or even a little under $9 is not terrible, so let's look at what kind of prices the market may be able to offer us here in the next week or so with this weather disruption we're looking at. One thing i like to point out, I think it's really the great story we've seen in recent years. You have big yields, a run of big yields in the recent years, but when we look at production here in soybeans, same story for corn, yeah. we went from uh, less than 4 billion bushels of production in, in 2015, mm -hmm. now we're looking at 4.2 billion bushels. But the really, I guess, the saving grace, which is keeping us from that 1980s scenario, is that uh, usage uh, has also increased. We've had strong response from the usage side, especially those exports and those export markets in the right. Asia and China for soybeans. So we've been having large crops. We've been able to work through these crops. And we've ending stocks have increased, but it hasn't, I guess, been a train wreck or a disaster. Absolutely. This is not the 1980s. We can say again, in the 1980s, we lost a substantial amount of the big growth of exports that we saw in the 1970s. That's a boom bust scenario. We have not lost demand. We have not lost usage. We've had very good crops in the world as well. So uh, we've got possibilities of having better prices, unlike we really had in the 1980s. So let's talk a little bit about soybean prices. This is the old crop, thinking about the August futures prices, uh, crossing over that 950 range uh, earlier this morning on the electronic trading uh, is, is 980 or $10 in the, in the future a possibility, potentially. Well, uh, again, this would be for those old crop inventory. Uh, in the 980 we've marked as one of those areas where we had seen the market rally back earlier in the spring. Uh, overall, as we realize the acreage and the big shift, you can see how we've come down from well above $10 beans uh, down to where we were talking about $9 or under $9 bids. So it's like a reprieve we have here. Here's a second chance if you've held on this long, as many have to some old crop stocks. Uh, these are futures at 980, but then a reasonable chance that we, if, if the weather concerns continue, would push back above $10 on old crop futures. And then I think we're next, we'll have the new crop futures. Uh, again, let's think about prices, uh, harvest time prices down around $9 or high eights would be our uh, best guess at a nor everything turned normal for the rest of the year. So opportunities to price that are uh, above $9 would be at least worthy of consideration. So we've got uh, 980 uh, November beans. Did you see what those were? I, I did not see that yet. Probably around 970, something in that range. Now we're probably close to 980. 
Yeah, 977. 977, so it looks like a, a shot right now. This makes a lot of sense to maybe start, but I think most people are going to be looking at the $10 mark <laughs> uh, on new crop beans, and I think we'll, if, if your beans look fairly reasonable at this point, especially Eastern Corn Belt, uh, where it looks like we've got moisture in the forecast, uh, $10, and then uh, we could go up from there. So uh, the summary here is a little bit more uh, yeah, a little friendlier to beans. Again, we have this high acreage that says we're going to increase our carryouts a little more. But again, we have the vulnerability of the weather. I think uh, the crop yields at this point, we'd have to call them nationally pretty close to normal. Couldn't call those one way or another. More vulnerability on beans, maybe 20, 25 percent of the beans vulnerable to this uh, upper Great Plains, uh, northwestern part of the Corn Belt weather problems. Old crop beans, uh, gosh, still have an opportunity, second opportunity. <laughs> if we passed up the $10, didn't think we were going to get that, so take advantage. Phase up pricing, and we remind uh, everyone that beans do have a longer time period. They could take a lot of stress in July, and then if weather is more advantageous in August, those yields can recover and cert certainly get back to normal or above normal. So I think one of the big takeaways here is to uh, brush up on the marketing plan, revisit That's the right. marketing plan. Look at your pricing points, be ready to execute. Know your cost of production, what you're comfortable to market at, scout your fields, know what yield levels you might be ready to And, to and if your crop out. looks reasonable, as much of the country does at this point, if your crop looks reasonable, then say, thank you for an opportunity. <laughs> knock, knock, <laughs> knock. What is that? Opportunity <laughs> knocking to price, with if, especially if your crops look reasonable. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit in the last few minutes about how uh, the marketing situation, the yield situation might uh, look if you're uh, uh, on the specific farm level. Uh, here, Dr. Michael Langemeyer has a, a great case farm that he tracks in, over time. This is in West Central Indiana, and uh, from 7 to 16, these are historic yields, historic prices, and uh, quite a few data points here. One of them is the contribution margin in the bar chart. This is how much is left after you have your revenue less your variable cost of production, your seed, fertilizer, fuel. As you can see, this has trended lower uh, since 2011 when it uh, peaked out for a corn-soybean rotation at $500 an acre. We're now hovering around that $250 an acre. In blue, this is the returns to farmland, that net return. Uh, after you pay family living expenses and machinery costs, how much is left for uh, return to land or to pay cash rent? And finally, the triangle here is earnings. And you can see uh, 17 has been setting up for to be the fourth year of negative economic returns, negative earnings. And right now, this slide here shows us trend yield. So what happens if we have an average yield uh, not as bad as it was in 2015 at a negative $150 in rich earnings, uh, but hovering around that $100 an acre in losses. Uh, I'm going to switch slides here and keep an eye on this 17 graph. Uh, we're going to assume a 10% yield reduction, which is uh, what Chris talked about earlier with these poorer crop ratings here we've seen in Indiana uh, and throughout June. And you're going to see that these graphs and these lines are going to drop. Uh, closer to that $200 an acre contribution margin uh, and somewhere getting closer to that $150 an acre in economic losses. And so there was a bit of optimism, I think, last year with large crops and stable prices, at least here in Indiana, that we could see kind of return to break even. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if we see below trend yields uh, and some difficult pricing situations, and these are really prices that we would have saw a couple weeks ago, more like 340 uh, cash price for corn. Uh, we've seen quite a bit adding in the markets in the last week or so. Again, another opportunity knocking for you to maybe lock in some uh, prices with this upturn in the market in the last few days. So uh, I think the takeaway message here is that um, it's not all clear. There are still some difficulties in the crop budgets. And when there is an opportunity to do some uh, marketing at a, a good price, uh, producers should take a, uh, a jump at that opportunity. The next thing we're going to take a look at here is uh, a few macro trends that are important for managers to keep an eye on, and really for the next 12 months or 24 months as they look ahead. The first one has been interest rates. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been uh, stepping up interest rates really since the end of 2015 and throughout 16. And we picked this graph intentionally 
Uh, there's been a lot of headline and speculation about how much the interest rates have gone up or will gone up, and you can see that blip up there to the right in 2016. But we zoomed out. This is the six-month Treasury bill uh, interest rates. We zoomed out back to 2000, and so uh, the question is, is where do we go from here? Is it up from here? Do we return more to those 2000 or 2007, 2008 levels, or do we see kind of a slow moderation uh, from 2012, 2014 lows as we step higher. This has implications for exchange rates, which can impact commodity prices. This has implications for farmland values, as well as we talk about borrowing uh, money. Also has implications for operating costs, when you think about uh, operating lines of credit. So just kind of a long run trend here that producers are gonna wanna keep an eye on. The second one here, uh, to keep an eye on, we've already hinted at is, is exchange rates. Low exchange rates make it uh, relatively cheaper for our foreign buyers to buy the U.S. dollar at a more affordable or cheaper rate than they can buy our grain. We had a low, a low exchange rate uh, period here in the 2008-2012 uh, uh, timeframes. This corresponds with that boom era we saw in agriculture. Uh, an often overlooked uh, driver here is this low exchange rate environment. We've seen since 2014 exchange rates have ticked higher. Uh, mostly sideways since mid-2015. Where do we go from here? A very important trend to keep in mind. And, and if we zoomed in on the graph here a little bit in the last six months, exchange rates have trended lower since the first of the year, uh, which I think has been helpful for some of these export markets as the dollar, again, has become a little more affordable, a little cheaper, can means our buyers can purchase But I think more. your message is that the, these still are headwinds. We're overall substantially higher than the very high price period and that makes it harder to get really high prices uh, because of the exchange rates. Yep, and it's really an important trend to keep an eye on in the next year or two. Where, where do we go from here? Uh, so to kind of summarize today's webinar, again, if you have any questions, we invite you to email those to us and we'll follow up uh, later today or throughout the week. Uh, again, tight margin period continues, looking at these crop budgets here in Indiana. Uh, if we have a, a drop in yields, especially that 10%, kind of before crop insurance might kick in. Uh, there's going to be some tough uh, margins there. There are strong grain inventories out there, uh, but we might start to see these ending stocks uh, turn lower, especially if we have uh, some production hiccups and uh, some below trend yields starting to come in. And finally, uh, a really strong base for demand. We've seen that in the exports. We've seen that in domestic consumption. That's really been the unsung hero here the last few years when we've had very large above trend yields. And that's kept, while ending stocks have grown, that's really kept that from mushrooming and, and kind of getting out of control. Well, I might just add that, uh, you know, this opportunity, this, this uh, was not expected. We were gonna get this opportunity. You never expect weather problems to pop up, but uh, keep that in mind and more than keep it in mind, uh, start right now looking at where you would sell both old crop and new crop and do some pricing. Uh, I, we, we have the, the boom period brought more competition. So we're going to have to be competitive in U.S. agriculture. We can't count on uh, prices, I think, to come in and give us uh, uh, substantially higher prices, but uh, prices maybe that get us back uh, up to that closer to the $4 mark uh, on corn and hopefully back to 10, 10 plus on soybeans, I think are reasonable areas in the next few years we can think about. But I, the f uh, final point I'd make is that we're not through the woods in terms of these tight margins. I don't think we're just gonna suddenly bounce to substantially higher prices. And so all those things we have been doing on the farm of watching our family budget, of watching our expenditures on capital, on machinery and equipment, uh, working with our landlords to try to get more reasonable, and I'm generally talking about lower, more moderate uh, cash rents. Uh, looking at our efficiency, if that uh, comes on the farm, if we use that technology, that technology has to pay its way. These are basic economic business concepts. Uh, doing everything we can to make sure that we are efficient in terms of production and are trying to drive our cost per bushel lower. Those are good economic principles anytime, and they certainly are now. 
and with as tight margins probably continuing for a while. Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Hurt, for joining me and, and sharing great management tips here uh, for producers to take home and, and think about in the last uh, last few months of the growing season as we start to get more confidence in where uh, the 2017 crop lines up. With the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm David Widmar. Thanks for joining us.